Guernsey is Europe's leading captive insurance domicile and number four in the world, with almost £5 billion of insurance premium written on the island and nearly half of the biggest firms on the London Stock Exchange owning captives there. In this special report, Captive Review will discover how Guernsey is responding to regulatory reform in the EU, why cell business is driving its growth, and how innovation is key to its future success. First up, we asked former Captive Manager and current Guernsey Finance CEO, Dominic Wheatley, why Guernsey continues to be regarded as one of the world's leading captive centres. I would say there are three key elements. One is the, the quality of service and the quality of the industry here, uh, the quality of infrastructure uh, and the quality of the insurance management fraternity here. Uh, the second is the innovation, which began with uh, the very pioneering uh, work of Steve Butterworth, who was our regulator in the 90s uh, and uh, was uh, instrumental, highly instrumental in the introduction of protective cell company legislation here. But that history of innovation has carried through and is now emerging through our developing ILS markets. Um, the third uh, reason I think why we're uh, successful um, is because of the regulatory environment that we have had over the last 20 years. Uh, again, I mentioned Steve, but also his successors, uh, right down to the excellent work that Caroline Bradley is doing, introducing the um, International Association of Insurance Supervisor core principles uh, this year. Um, and, and I think that that is part of uh, an established trend of excellence in our regulatory framework. Guernsey has a very um, strong established position in the international captive firmament. Um, it's been a a centre of excellence and innovation really since the since we emerged in the 1990s uh, as, a, as the uh, dominant um, jurisdiction in the European region. And I think we're a general genuine contender now uh, as, a, as a, a, an established member of the top five jurisdictions alongside Bermuda uh, and Vermont. We had about 85 uh, new formations in Guernsey last year, which is about 10% top line growth uh, with licenses in total of about 800. So that is fantastic uh, in, in terms of a rate of growth uh, uh, by any benchmark globally. ILS has been weighted to about 40% of that. Uh, and that is just uh, continuing as we've seen in recent years uh, with increasing deal flow. Um, there have been the, the, the nascent reinsurance startups uh, and the, uh, the the pension longevity business standalones have been reasonably static, uh, but um, they've been holding the position. So uh, all in all, uh, a pretty uh, bullish outlook for the industry. Very exciting to uh, to welcome the first rated reinsurer, Kelvin Ree, to Guernsey uh, last year, and then also uh, uh, latterly uh, we had the incorporations of the uh, the vehicles that have been set up for the the pension longevity uh, solutions. Uh, BT uh, Towers Watson have set up a, a a vehicle to be able to do more of the pension longevity business. Uh, the Merchant Navy officers, of course. So uh, diversification. Uh, you know, across a, a number of uh, core and near core areas. Traditional captives are still being formed. Uh, we're seeing a number of formations uh, across the island um, each year. Um, however, on an overall net basis, you would probably have to say that um, it's a fairly mature market and um, it's fairly static in terms of licensed uh, entities. Where the captives are coming from, where well, they continue to be sourced from um, various domiciles uh, uh, globally uh, and also um, from a wide range of industries. From Robus's perspective, we are seeing um, a number of Lloyd syndicates and MGAs uh, which are setting up uh, captive insurance vehicles with us. The significant area of growth, though, continues to be on, in uh, protective cell companies um, and uh, that. Uh, continues apace. Since 2011, the number of licensed cells um, has increased by 90 vehicles um, and also incorporated cells and in the same time period that has increased by just over 30 companies. The main driver of cell growth continues to be insurance linked securities uh, and has been since, well really since 2007 um, and we've seen a significant number of formations in that respect. Ever since it crafted the first protected cell company legislation back in 1997, Guernsey has been seen as a centre of excellence for cell innovation. According to captive manager Chris LeConte, 
Cell Business is now integral to the future growth of Guernsey's captive sector. It's been absolutely vital the last two or three years. The captive sector generically has been fairly flat, uh, possibly even in decline, but the cell um, element has grown exponentially actually over the last two or three years. We witness that here at Robust, but so has the wider elements of, of Guernsey. Presumably we'll plateau out at some point, but we don't see that in 2015 or probably even 16. It is driving growth in Guernsey and indeed other domiciles around the world. Certainly for us here at Robus, it has been a, a massive catalyst to our business and a big driver of our business, not just on the ILS side, but also various reinsurance vehicles that we've set up, both under cell structures and incorporated cell structures. Certainly we've seen in Kane a number of mainland Europe clients uh, begin in 2014, even in 2013, ranging from uh, Switzerland, Eastern Europe, and also in what I would call the Eurozone as well. Uh, and the reason why that is, is because uh, a lot of the European markets still uses London as the main focal point for insurance. Um, and we've seen that the European marketplace, or certainly mainland Europe, uh, has really effectively caught up with the UK in terms of understanding the cell strategies and the cell concept. Um, and as a result of that, they're looking for opportunities, once again, to maximize their own return on capital internally by using a cell structure to access their profitability uh, for their own organization. And we're seeing that um, they understand this concept is outside of Solvency 2. They're comfortable with locations such as Guernsey. Um, and these can provide facilities which other mainland European jurisdictions cannot provide. Well, I can only say our expertise is exceptional compared to other jurisdictions. We invented the PCC concept back in 1997, so we've got the longest experience of it. Most other domiciles have copied our legislation. Our lawyers understand it the best. Um, our regulators understand it the best. The managers understand it the best. Uh, so I think other domiciles undoubtedly do have cell experience or a variant of it, but I would say Guernsey is uh, the focal point for most cell experience and expertise. And also we're looking to expand on those structures as well. So we've developed from the protected cell company to the incorporated cell company, and also looking, for example, to develop areas whereby we can provide blanket authority, provide the similarity between the products being, uh, being regulated. Uh, one area of, of recent innovation has been the use of cell structures for longevity risk. And that's been very popular in the UK pension environment uh, there have been a number of, of deals of that nature put together. Uh, we see that very much as, as a part of a trend. Um, longevity risk is, is a, a significant issue for pensions in the regulatory environment in which they work. So for them to be able to finance those more effectively in the reinsurance market uh, is obviously adding a lot of value for them. There are some interesting things we've been asked to do for clients at the moment. What The first one in the captive sector is to create a, a, a hybrid of a captive, which will be partially owned by a third party. And the way in which we're going to achieve that, we think, is to list a, a preference share class in the captive. And the preference shares will be able to enjoy the profits associated with a particular underwriting project. Those two parties, the captive owner and the third party, are in business together anyway in a joint venture and it makes sense for them to share the benefits of the project that they're working on. It's a very large capital project, and we, we think that that will have real benefits. And we believe that'll be the first uh, captive to be um, owned partially by a third party. So it's not quite an insurer. It's still controlled by the, by the parent owner, but they're able to bring capital in uh, without uh, losing control of their underwriting program and the fact that they, they own their own captive. The other one is um, something we've been working on for, or working towards certainly for a long time, which is to try and create a hybrid structure, uh, which is an insurance company, but also an investment fund at the same time. It's quite difficult to explain on camera, but the, the basis of it is that um, capital can be put in over a, over a period of time as it would be, say, in a closed-ended um, private equity fund uh, structured as a limited partnership. But the general partner of the partnership is itself an insurer, so it covers both sides, which means you don't need two separate structures to perform the types of deals and operations which you'd normally find in the ILS sector between an ILS fund proper and the insurance company or transformer vehicles that it works through. So both of those are completely innovative. We hope there will be a success this year. The lines between insurance and the financial markets are increasingly blurring, 
But when it comes to their own money, captives have typically been conservative investors. We visited Barclays economist Hank Potts to find out where captives should put their money in 2015. Well, we work with captive insurers in Guernsey and around the world, and we know that they've had to adapt to changing market conditions. Traditionally, of course, a captive didn't want to take any risk in terms of the investment portfolio. It was about just generating the returns that they could. So they went to fixed income markets. They went to the safe haven of quality government bonds. But in the years after the financial crisis, those returns diminished quite substantially. So they were forced to look elsewhere across different asset classes. So they went into investment grade. They started to look into high yield. Increasingly, what we've been doing, working with clients, is saying actually there is a possibility of gaining good returns from equity markets, but doing it in a managed and risk-adjusted way. And that's probably one of the biggest changes that we've seen in terms of our interaction with captive clients. The biggest question that we get from clients, including captives at the moment, should they continue to invest in equity markets given the strong performance that we've seen over the course of the past few years? And the answer to that is still very simple. I think it's yes, because actually it's the best place for value. Value, of course, in equity markets, not as cheap as where it was just a few years ago. But I think the fundamentals still look very good. If you look at corporate profitability growth, still growing at a rapid rate. If you look for Europe during the course of this year, you're still talking about 10% earnings growth. Analysts still optimistic about what's happening in the United States. Balance sheets still look very healthy indeed. Valuations, well, maybe you're paying 15 and a half times multiple for the S&P 500, I think it's a little bit lower in the Eurozone, around 13 and a half times. So still plenty of opportunities for investors to take advantage of that. In the past couple of years, we've said to clients, in terms of equity markets, it's US, it's US, it's US. And that's where the outperformance has been coming. But actually, we're more optimistic about what's happening in the Eurozone. Try to take advantage of some of those beaten up valuations. We know the European Central Bank will continue to be very supportive of the growth that they're trying to generate within the Eurozone. That quantitative easing program, what does that mean? The Euro, as we said, is going to be weaker. That's going to be helping the big exporters. So we are more optimistic about what's going to be happening in Europe from an economic perspective and from a corporate perspective as we go through the rest of this year. While a raft of landmark regulatory reform sweeps across the EU, Guernsey's position as an offshore domicile has allowed it to tailor its own rules, taking into account the unique circumstances and requirements of the captive sector. Captive lawyer Mark Hellier told us more. Well, it's going to be quite an interesting time in 2015 for the, uh, the Guernsey sector. We've recently completed the uh, drafting of some guidance in the ILS sector, which we hope will be formalised and issued before the end of March. Uh, I've also been asked to assist with the drafting of legislation for SPV insurers. At the moment, the ILS sector is, is uh, governed by a series of discretions under the law which the Financial Services Commission can apply, and the industry would like something more formal which reflects what happens in other jurisdictions such as Bermuda. In, in other areas, Guernsey has just implemented um, some new regulations coming into force in early 2015, which applies to the solvency of captives, which mirrors the provisions of Solvency 2. That's been extensively tested. We don't expect it to have any um, significant impact on operational aspects of captives in Guernsey, but it is, an, it is a new thing uh, and it is, a, it is a mirror of what Solvency 2 is. We think it's better because it's less prescriptive uh, and it can also apply to different types of insurers better, whereas the Solvency 2 model is really designed for large proper insurance companies as opposed to private insurers. We gathered our service providers at the offices of Bedell Kristin to discuss the implications of Guernsey's new solvency rules, as well as other pressing issues affecting Guernsey. Regulatory developments first. Um, we've got some new solvency regulations coming into force in Guernsey, which will apply to insurance companies. What do you think the effect's going to be in 2015? Um, I think like all these things in the first year, uh, getting a better understanding, how to complete the forms and all those kind of issues may take some time uh, and all time to, to take time to bed in because of that. But uh, overall, I don't think it'll have a great impact in terms of day to day running. In terms of uh, the uh, impression of the island and its reputation, I think it will improve because of that. Um, but we're a long, long way away from solvency two and going down the prescription route. Uh, that that is at the moment. I agree, and I think that's the key point because Guernsey FSC, on the one hand, need to and Guernsey need to be able to demonstrate that we are 
you know, in accordance with international standards and taking a risk-based approach. And so some sort of model needed to be developed. But alongside that, we've got to retain the pragmatism and so on. And, and what you know, I think we will feel comfortable about is A, I agree from all the testing, and there's been quite a lot of it, almost everybody passes the model, which is pretty robust. And on the other hand, we know that Guernsey FSC uh, have some leeway in terms of you know, allowing certain um, either transition periods or uh, they still have the ability to amend if they want um, through their own judgment. So I don't think it's going to cause major issues for anybody. No doubt there will be a few insurers who will have to apply more capital or mm. change their business model as a result, but it won't be a lot out of the many hundreds that we have on the island. The offshore world is under intense scrutiny, um, well, has been for years, but it always seems to get more and more intense on tax and the issues of offshore tax. What are your views on Guernsey's place in that and where we stand in the world and what are the advantages of being in Guernsey from a tax perspective, if any? Um, it's a difficult position for the whole of the off offshore world, I think, at the moment. Onshore jurisdictions are looking to make sure they, they generate as much tax income as possible. And, you know, there are various different approaches to that. We, you know, you can have the French approach where you put everything up to 75% and chase people offshore or to other countries like Russia. Or, or, or you try and develop business to, to make sure that there's more, more coming in. The, the problem that we've got in, off, in the offshore world is that there's a lot more lobbying activity going on from certain organisations. And they are kind of developing a very simple message, which is that anything that's offshore is wrong. And patently, that's really not the case. There are very good arbitrage reasons and regulatory reasons why the business which is done here for example can't be done in London so for exa an example in London you can't have a PCC it's not possible to form one it's not possible under the regulations to have a managed uh, captive in the same sense as we have them here the professional services don't exist to do it um, generally speaking parent companies say from the UK are going to have to pay tax one way or another Either the, the money is used for reserving or it's repaid, and that's the way that the tax focus happens on captives. So very largely speaking, these this market is not a tax play in the same way as you know private family structures might be or other types of um, personal wealth. So I think it's, as a market, it's something that really stands quite resiliently against that kind of discussion and background and the polemic that we have coming out the political parties and I think it's it's actually much easier to defend that than it is other industries in, in the island. How much do you think Guernsey is reliant on the cell company concept? A little bit too much at the moment I would say in terms of growth terms I mean we definitely the bulk of our business remains non-cell I would say if you look at the whole stack of business that we have in the island but in terms of where the business has been coming from and where it is going to over the last two, three years, and probably the next year or two, it is all driven by cell business. I think we all know that the captive market is fairly static, and I mean in the purest sense. I'm not saying new ones aren't being formed, because they are, but equally, licenses are being relinquished, and therefore it's pretty flat. Whereas uh, the cell business is booming, um, as is the incorporated cell business, so we are hugely reliant on it at the moment to drive new business. And I think we do need to keep an eye on that, because make hay while the sun shines by all means no doubt about that and we should take advantage of it and we are i think a whole group of us very well but we need to keep an eye on other op opportunities as well and not just put all our eggs in one basket and say we're a cell domicile we should be other things to other people yeah i mean i agree with that it's, it's getting on for a hundred percent of what what we're involved in at the moment is is new cells and new cell structures particularly in the ils sector lots of uh, people forming new cells and Actually, the, the, the number of cells isn't actually a very good measure of the amount of transactions because many of the cells that are going on are writing multiple transactions. So there are literally hundreds more going on in the starting blocks than was the case four or five years ago. Um, on a positive note, I mean, from a, from a lawyer's perspective, we get asked and we get employed by foreign governments and regulators to help them set up their own PCC legislation and ICCs. And they're not always in a directly competitive market. They might be using it for investment funds or so on. But the fact that the jurisdiction does that really well is, a, is quite a good selling point from our perspective. So what does the future hold for Guernsey's captive sector? And how can it ensure it maintains its position as one of the captive industry's most important jurisdictions? Well, Guernsey International Insurance Association uh, 
which I've been chairing for the last couple of years, has a vision to position Guernsey as an alternative to Bermuda uh, as an insurance centre. Uh, and that, I think, is, is, is a vision that we're beginning to realise with the first commercial rated reinsurer and more to follow. The, uh, the challenges, as ever, access to markets. Uh, uh, we're a relatively small uh, jurisdiction uh, and larger countries uh, tend to try to be protectionist and hold their uh, domestic insurance industry uh, within their territorial boundaries. Uh, that said, we've got some great partnerships with all the largest uh, insurance players in the world uh, and, uh, and that gives us great access to markets. And as our reputation grows from strength to strength, uh, we expect uh, greater and greater uh, direct uh, penetration of those markets. So uh, quite, uh, we're quite um, confident uh, that uh, uh, that shouldn't be uh, a, an impediment to our growth. As more clients come, as talent comes, uh, we're well positioned near to London uh, and we just see more, uh, more and more momentum building and uh, a greater propensity of clients to want to come and use Guernsey. I think when you look at why people have captives, they're looking for uh, a, a secure financial arrangement for the funding of their insurable risk in their business. They want uh, a solid platform. They want a strong regulatory regime. Uh, they want good governance. They want strong management and effective management and quality advice. All of those are available right here in Guernsey uh, at, uh, at a level of quality that isn't necessarily available in other jurisdictions.